All right, there you go. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. So our last speaker of the afternoon is uh, Mano Costa, who will talk to us about the emergence of homogamy in the two-loci stochastic population model. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so Mano, please. Yeah, thank you for having me here, even though my topic is not so much about branching processes, but like a bit. Um, I'm actually studying some population with a strong interaction, so that's why uh, branching will actually not be the main tool, but we'll see that uh, uh, we'll be able to study the behavior of the population using comparison with branching processes. So let me give you some um, clues about what actually is homogamy and uh, like a lot of biological uh, uh, motivation for this work. Um, so before I start, it's a joint work with Camille Coron, Fabien Laroche, Hélène Lemont, and Charlene Smadi. Okay, so yeah, I need to be on the good side. So. Um, what is homogamy? Homogamy is like something that uh, belongs to the family of assortative mating, which means that uh, when you have a population which mates uh, with each other, then individual will uh, tend to prefer uh, individual which have similar phenotypes to reproduce. And they tend to reproduce less with individuals uh, with different phenotypes. So this kind of... Um, um, mating pattern um, is very well studied in biology for several reasons. First, uh, there exist a lot of examples of such uh, behavior in natural populations. Uh, for example, uh, in butterflies community, um, uh, some butterflies which have a very uh, strong uh, wings patterns tend to reproduce with individuals with, with similar wing patterns because it will uh, give their descendants uh, like an advantage if the wing patterns uh, allows you to hide well or is recognized by um, is not well recognized by um, predators then you want your children to have the same as yours and therefore you'll reproduce with someone with similar wing patterns and also it's actually uh, supposed to be a driving force for reproductive isolations because uh, individual uh, have an advantage to be among individuals which are similar to themselves. So it tends to create uh, uh, populations that gather individuals of the same types. Okay. So here our question is, how do such a mechanism arise in a randomly mating population? And actually we want to consider two types of, of phenomenon. First, we'll assume that individual will have an advantage we are reproducing with their own types, but there will also be a cost at reproducing with other types. And this cost can, uh, will come with uh, the fact that you'll uh, reproduce um, less with other types. And the global intuition is that, of course, is, uh, if the advantage, advantage is higher than the cost, then um, such a mutant uh, will arise in the population, but also there might be cases where maybe the cost is large, but if you are in, in a population with very uh, a lot of individuals with, which are of your type, then uh, your choosiness can be compensated. Okay. And actually we are gonna see um, this two uh, types of, um, of cases a bit later. So I'm going to present you a quite uh, for a long time the model and afterwards what we did with it. So uh, the model is a multi-type birth and death process because if we want to uh, consider well the mating phenomenon, there of course will be an uh, interaction between individuals uh, and uh, proportions of uh, each type will be of importance. So we'll look at uh, two different locus in the genome. One which codes for the phenotypes, which will be either large A or small A. And one, one which will code for having a preference, which will be the large P or not having a preference and mating uniformly, which will be the small P. We have uh, three ecological parameters, which are the same for everyone. Uh, standard birth rate B, uh, death rate D, and some competition among individuals. 
And um, we, could, we assume that there is a scaling limits in large K. So uh, at the end, large K will go to infinity and K actually scales for uh, the total population size. And it will be a scaling for the competition. So you have to imagine that uh, you po your population is almost of si size K, which is going to be very large. So first, let's look at what happens before uh, uh, the mutant arrives. So before the mutant arrives, everyone mates uniformly at random. So you have to assume that at rate B, every individual chooses independently a mate uniformly. And uh, when you have chosen a mate, then your descendants will have uh, one of the both alleles uh, uh, vary on a very simple uh, Mendelian rules. So meaning that uh, with probability one half, you take uh, your the parents one uh, type and uh, with probability one half, the other type. So with this model, actually the birth rate of an individual of type alpha, which is just either alpha is either large A or small A, it just B times the number of individuals. So here, the uniform uh, reproduction change, uh, doesn't change anything. So you don't see uh, that there are two parents. And our death rate is written like this. So you have uh, the death rate, and here it's the scaling of the competition. And you, you are in competition with everyone in the population. So with large A and small individuals, okay? So here I just uh, written one allele because I just have, um, that's uh, since there is no mutant, everyone carries small p, okay? So here uh, everyone carries a small p. So a uh, very classical results uh, uh, from uh, Etienne and Kurtz uh, say that when k is large, the population can be rescaled and uh, the evolution uh, can be compared with a competitive lotka voltaire equation. So when you rescale your population size by k, then uh, you get that uh, the system becomes deterministic and behave like this. And such a system is very well known. We know that if B is larger than D, then there exists positive equilibria. And actually, there are an infinite number of equilibria, which are all combination with total size equals B minus D over C, and any choice of proportion works, okay? So this will actually bring us a lot of difficulties uh, afterwards, because um, when we study invasions of mutants, one actually prefers when the, what we call the resident population is that the, res the population that was here before the mutations, we actually like that it stays attracted near to a very uh, attractive um, equilibrium. So you, you like that you're, uh, under the, your underlying uh, deterministic system admits a unique, uh, globally asymptotically stable equilibrium. Therefore, um, you can prove that uh, the stochastic populations remains for a long time in a neighborhood of this equilibrium. Here, it's a bit difficult because uh, we will be able to control the total population size, but for proportion will have to work. Okay, uh, please do not hesitate to ask questions if something is unclear about the model. So now I'm going to present you the, um, the mutant uh, behavior. So we assume that, uh, so mutant has a large P and uh, I'm saying that it's on a different chromosome for the phenotype, meaning that we do not take into account any recombination. So both allele, um, um, are um, given uh, very independently to the descendant. So, so we'll uh, encode the advantage uh, of um, mating with someone of your, of your own type by a parameter beta one, meaning that when an individual of a phenotype a large A, small p mates with a large A, then the birth weight is is modified and it's B times one plus beta one. And on the contrary, the cost is encoded by the beta two here. So meaning that when uh, A large P mate with any small A, the birth weight is B times one minus beta two. 
Okay, so this will be the two parameters of interest. So let me explain a bit how we construct the birth rate. So here, so it's a bit complicated because you have to uh, make a difference uh, whether who is the choosing parent and who is the chosen parent. Because we assume that only the one that chooses this partner uh, can uh, apply its preference. So first here you have a crossing tables of all types and it's couples to generate a large A, small P. So the number here, first just look at number and not at colors. It's a probability depending on that your both parents are here to give the allele large A and small P. So here it's one. In this case, it's a one half because you just have one half chance to give the large A and not the small A and one, uh, chance one to give the small P. So you just have one half and so on on each case. And afterwards, the colors are um, differs whether you what the birth rate you apply. So here, the choosing parents carry the allele small p, so he may randomly. So that's why there is the blue one. Here, uh, it's uh, choosing parents with allele large p. Here, he mates with a large a like himself, so he he has an advantage. And here, he mates with a small a not like himself, so there is a cost. And very similarly here. So when you gather everything. Uh, you get this ugly formula for <laughs> the birth rate of individuals with a large A, small p. And you'll have something very similar uh, so in the opposite case here. So you see that uh, our formulas are very intricate and it really doesn't look like the model before and it's not at all something that is a branching process. So our questions are the following. Under which condition will the mutant invade? What will be the invasion probability? And what will be the finite state of the population? We'll also look at the invasion time scales, which is the, the global time needed for a mutant that will invade to um, be um, uh, well, uh, well installed in the population. So to have a very large population. So I'm mainly, uh, uh, speak about uh, the three first questions, which actually are very correlated. So let me um, explain to you a bit how one usually does the thing. So with a drawing, it's like better. So you usually works in this setting. You have a resident population which is close to uh, an equilibria. So here it moves around its equilibrium. You first, at, at one point, you have one mutant and you look at what happens until it reach a size which is high enough. So uh, rem remember that here the population is of size like large K. And here you assume until it's, you wait until it reaches a, a level epsilon that times k. So it means that you have a macroscopic population. So when you divide by k, uh, the mutant population does not vanish. Okay. So there is at one point here where this happened. So the first work is to ensure that while the mutant grows until epsilon k or dies out, this population will not change too much. Afterwards, your both population are of size k, so you compare with a deterministic system. Okay, so that's phase two. And at the end, uh, there might be an extinction of a population, so not here in this case, but if the resident population goes too, high, too low, or actually if here it's not fit enough, that it might go extinct. And the third phase is a bit like this one. So you want this population to stay close to an equilibria and you study the extinction. So there are two phases in which you make like, you use branching processes is this first phase where you tend, you would like to compare the mutant behavior with a branching process. And here, when you want to compare uh, populations that might go extinct with branching processes. 
In this phase, if the mutant invade, the branching process will be super critical. And here, if the population dies out, it's uh, subcritical. Okay. So here, actually, the issue is that we are not in one. So our resident population is not one dimensional, it's two dimensional because we have the two alleles. So that complicates lots of things. So actually, what is going to happen? For us, so here I draw the resident population. So you have A, P, and you have small a, small p. What we know is that the deterministic equilibrium lives around uh, this line, where the total population size is constant. And at the beginning, when the mutant starts, you have an initial proportion. So here it's a proportion. when mutant uh, arises. So when there is only one mutant. And so first point is that we'll have to control what happens for the proportion so that it doesn't go too far away. Otherwise we'll have difficulties to compare the, uh, the mutant population uh, while growing up, okay? So let me be a bit more specific. So first, um, the first thing is to control the resident population size. So what we want to do, alors, first there are things that are easy. It's actually, I don't know why I didn't write it in the good order. So what we would like to say is that we, we know that uh, there are classical large deviation results that ensure that the total uh, small p population size will be close to this quantity, so the, its equilibria quantity during an exponential time. So it will be a very long time um, before um, uh, the total population size deviates from, it, from its equilibrium. Um, so if we can compare the mutant population with a subcritical branching process, the time until it reach a size of epsilon k is of order log k. So this time will be much shorter than this one. And we also want to uh, couple the small p population size with a, a logistic process as long as the large p population size is small. So here we have like, um, th this works uh, pretty well. But um, our issues arise uh, when we want to uh, control the proportion in the resident population size. So we call that the resident population size remains close to this line, but we don't know how it deviates from the initial proportion. Why we don't know that? Because uh, there is an infinite number of equilibrium in the de deterministic system, and all these equilibrium are not hyperbolic. And so what we are going to, so, and this actually, why is it an issue? Because otherwise it won't be an issue. It's an issue because you want to study the trajectory of the, so here it's a mutant population. So first you start here with just one mutant. And afterwards you want to see what happens until it reaches this line when it's like small. But if you want to compare it with a branching process, you would like this population to be freeze because the birth rate of mutant individual actually depends on proportion in the resident population. So the proportion here are very important to control what happens here. Because you see, as I said before, since you tend to reproduce with individual of your own type, if there are many individuals of your type in the resident population, it will help you, whether than if the population is very different, it will be a very huge cost, okay? So this means that actually we cannot do as uh, it is done cl in classic in uh, other wor works, in like previous works, because uh, both mutant and resident population has to be studied together. So what we do is like uh, in a two-step um, uh, work. First, we assume that the total large p population size is small of this order, and that the population of small p, the total population is close to its equilibrium. And then we are going to prove that the proportion of residents stay close to their initial value. 
So how, how do we do so? I will not, uh, not detail a lot the computation because uh, otherwise I'll be very short on time. Um, and I'm already short on time. Um, it's actually with a lot of um, classical um, inequality, we are able to prove that it remains to control this type of quantity, which we do by finding an adequate function um, for um, and use afterwards uh, like martingale techniques. Okay, and afterwards, I just want to tell you how we compare the large p population with a, a bi-type branching process. So now we assume that the initial population, its proportion as well as total size is like fixed and that the mutant population is small. And we approximate this birth rate, which is the birth rate of large LHP by something that looks like more branching process. So what you do is that here, this proportion you say, okay, is for large A. This is almost epsilon, so zero. And you do the same thing for all terms. And when you do so, you can compare your population with a branching process whose matrix is given here. So we'll do that very uh, um, well, and uh, it's like justified and so on in the article, but here I, I want to give the proof. And what we say, see is actually is that if um, this branching process with this matrix is super critical, then there'll be a probability of invasion and uh, otherwise there will be no invasion. And your proportion will be given uh, so at invasion, the proportion will be given uh, by the uh, eigenvector of associated with the largest eigenvalue, okay? So something that is interesting is that we can find a criterion, which is the following. To have a positive probability of extinction, either your advantage has to be larger than your cost or your proportion. So here's the proportion has to verify this inequality, meaning that actually, the diversity has to be um, not equilibrated. So proportion doesn't have to go around a uh, uh, half. Um, and we can compute numerically the invasion probability. And I show you graphs because it's like not intuitive. So here, what I draw is the extension probability for the approximating branching process. And I show it for a fixed cost and I change the advantage. Okay, so uh, what we see is that if the advantage is higher than the cost, which are these three first line, you can always invade, but the invasion probability will change depending on the proportion of large A individual first. Okay, and it looks like monotonous, meaning that you tend to uh, extinct less with a large number of individual your types. But it's not completely monotonous. There is a strong effect when proportion are equals here. So that was kind of counterintuitive for us. Maybe I'll skip the rest. And um, OK, uh, I'll talk to you a bit on the second phase, which was actually um, studying a four-dimensional um, dynamical system, which is not that nice. But in this case, we managed to study the whole behavior of the population and identify uh, for each initial condition to what to which equilibrium the system will converge. So our result uh, is the following. We assume that first, there were more large A in the initial uh, large P population and more large A everywhere. Then, uh, and that the mutant can invade. Then the populations uh, will uh, converge to an equilibrium where there is only large A, large P uh, that stay in the population. We'll have very similar results in other cases. So like if you run, uh, if you change who is um, uh, mostly present uh, first. So actually this has a biological importance because it means that when the mutant with a preference uh, invades the population, it kills the diversity in phenotypes because there is only large A in the population. And this is something that is quite weird because, uh, so I'll tell it a, a bit later, but uh, there are maybe a nice phenomenon that we'll need to look at later. So 
actually this uh, so the main point that was in, of interest for biologists was that uh, this kind of uh, preference uh, will kill diversity so yes and the last phase was a uh, extinction phase so we uh, after the um, so once your your system uh, is close to its final equilibrium we are able to couple all populations that has to go extinct with a subcritical branching process. And which is what is nice is that we can approximate the time of reaching zero uh, with a exact constant. So if I want to summarize everything, we have like if the initial condition, so at initial conditions, there is only one mutant, which is of type alpha. And uh, we assume that uh, the resident population is close to the equilibrium. And we are in a position where large A are at most at, the, at first. Then we have that if the mutant can invade, then with a probability that depends on its own type first, and this probability is given in the branching process, there will be fixation of this type, large A, large P. So the large A is the type that was um, at most in the resident population and not the type of the mutant, and uh, this probability, this fixation will be will occur in a time which is given by this uh, thing. Okay. So I put the mathematical result in the slide, but I won't show here because I'm short of time. I just want to give you some questions um, we that are left. So we have like questions. So first questions come of this uh, intuition of um, here we've proved that uh, when the mutant uh, invades the population, then it will carry uh, the allele that was um, that was mostly present in the resident population. And this actually really comes from the fact that we assume that there are no recombination in um, in the system because if you assume that actually the allele A and a are really linked and close to the allele large A, uh, large P, small p, then if they are linked together and there is no recombination, a mutant which is either alpha and large P, when it crosses with someone, it will give both allele together if there is no recombination. So you assume that if, uh, in the contrary, um, both allele are very linked uh, in the limits, um, the allele that should be uh, taken uh, by invasion of mutant will be the one of the mutant. So it's very uh, like there should be somewhere if the recombination scales appropriately with a K, uh, a phase transition from either uh, it's the allele uh, that was given by the resident population or it's the allele that is given by the mutant. And so that's something that has to be. Uh, studied because we didn't make the computations to find the right recombination scale. And the second thing is that here, are, of course, our model is monomorphic, meaning that everyone had just one copy of the genome and things can be very different in demorphic populations, but that's something much, much more complicated. So thank you all for listening. And yeah, I have, if you have any questions. Thank you, Manon, for for your talk. So we have time for some questions. So, well, if anyone raises his hand, I can see yeah. it, or oh, Pascal. Uh, yes, uh, thanks Manon. Um, uh, I was wondering, uh, is it biologically interesting to look at uh, continuous type space and uh, uh, say R or might be higher dimensional and then saying, okay, uh, uh, that you're uh, you preferentially mate with uh, people from your same uh, area. From type like of, well, not not necessarily. Yeah, well, you, you can see it geographically, but you can also see it as a as a type space, and then uh, yeah. you are more more uh, you want to meet with people from a type close to yours. Uh, are yes, there I, some I, biological models? Yeah, there are some biological models of this type actually. So usually, so the one I know are more in discrete times uh, in discrete uh, sets uh, of uh, genomes, but they are like models where you assume that your phenotypes is given by uh, a lot of alleles 
and that so which are on, on different loci and from this different loci you can compute the distance and afterwards the probability to mate with one other will depend on this distance so this like more um yeah genetic models uh, and i'm yeah not very familiar with uh, if to know whether they are continuous model but there, sh there should be hmm. I, I actually i don't know so, so, so the one that you mentioned is on, on, a, on a Hamming cube then, right? So, I mean, you have, uh, you have N loci and so you're- Yeah, you have N loci, one PDN. you have N loci and on each loci you can have like a number of alleles. Hmm. So it can be either zero one or more. Right. And from hmm. this you compute like a distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. And there is only biological work or, or also mathematically rigorous work? Yeah, there are some theoretical uh, work on this uh, kind of topics, but there were actually no uh, like fully uh, theoretical work on this uh, topic. M most of it were like um, uh, used a lot of uh, numerical simulations to, to obtain the results because yeah, as soon as your model is like tiny bit more complicated, it it's very difficult to analyze. Here you see, uh, since we have already four population, at some point we have like uh, multi-type branching processes or large dynamical system, and this uh, creates a lot of difficulties. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Is there? There's time for one more question, maybe. Well, if not, then let's thanks again, Manon and all the speakers of this uh, afternoon session. Yes. And uh, so now we have time for uh, a small meeting in the Gazelton area. So, well, I mean, the, the room stays open as, as long as you want, but uh, 